who, like a lot of people who uh, at, at some point have this, as I, as I pointed out to Lauren Rubin, have this uh, existential moment in their lives, what am I doing? There's got to be greater to my life and this life and the time that we have on this planet than uh, punching a clock and uh, accumulating uh, material things and uh, the rat race. And there's got to be more out there. Well, there is. And uh, you do have options. And our next guest uh, is living it and has been living it for, uh, what, 15 years? Coming up, Pat, over a decade now. The book is Through Travel and Air, Confessions of an Asylum-Seeking Canadian, and it's a pleasure to welcome Matt Hamilton to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. I howled a lot. That's uh, a good thing. Reading this book, I, I, uh, even though I've never been to Europe and I've never uh, backpacked, I have kind of roughed it. That was a long time ago. Uh, Andy has backpacked, uh, and she'll get to that in a second. I felt uh, that I was reading about what I would do. In an alterna uh, alternative universe, and you know, if I am a Gemini, so if I could split myself in two, <laughs> you probably have done what I would do. Oh, fantastic. Well, I think uh, part of the reason for writing the book is I wanted to show a lot of people out there that if they really want to make a change in their life, if they really want to head off and explore the world, we actually have that power. Because I'm actually just a normal guy. I was a normal guy. I went through university and fell into the rat race and just saw life slipping by. I uh, saw myself turning 65 before I had done anything and decided a change needed to be made. So I quit my job and sold all the stuff that I owned and bought a one-way flight to Scotland, kissed my family <laughs> goodbye and said I'll be back when I'm back. And uh, Why Scotland? Well, I think uh, a few reasons. The roots are Scottish, so I thought something deep down inside would know Scotland, and uh, that, that didn't come through at all. <laughs> uh, but other part of the reason is I wanted to get my feet wet in a country that spoke English. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been to Glasgow, but they speak Glaswegian there, and the Glaswegian <laughs> accent is thick and harsh, and uh, I almost didn't get out of the airport. I was standing there asking how to get into town, and... Didn't understand a word anybody was saying, but uh, obviously... So this is like Sean Connery to the nth degree, yeah. right? <laughs> Train spotting, those types of movies put nothing on it. You right. Gotta, oh, yeah, it's not even close. So what What was your... Uh, where are you from? I'm, uh, I'm from Ottawa, born oh. and raised. Yeah. Uh, went to Queen's University and then back to Ottawa uh, and right into the rat race. So yeah. I had never traveled before, never seen... Anything outside of North America. I'd taken a few holidays with the family, but they were usually like kind of all-inclusive packages. Certainly, had never roughed it or, right. or got my elbows. Dirty. So, but what was that moment that you decided to do this? Well, you know what it was. I was watching uh, 60 Minutes, and Andy Rooney had this philosophy about life being backwards. How you know the youth is wasted on the young, and uh, we really don't get into it until we're too old. And by that point, we're we're, we're sick and tired. And um, to me, that was an epiphany. Uh, that was all that I needed to really say, wait a second, you're right. We don't uh, get a second shot at life. There is no dress rehearsal. I was 24, and as I said, life was passing me by, and I just you know, made that big decision and said goodbye. So that w I thank Andy Rooney for, for getting me to get out of North America. Your, your original plan was what? Well, my original plan was to go around the world uh, without a timeline or itinerary. And the... I guess the basic guideline was if I liked a spot, I'd stay, and if I didn't, I'd move on. It was going to be as simple as that. Uh, if you'd asked me at the beginning of the trip how long this timeless trip around the world was going to take, I would have guessed two years at the most. Uh, it's been ten years and counting, and I still haven't touched South America yet. Um, there's an addiction to the world of traveling that I wasn't aware of. Uh, I mean, the people you meet are one thing, but it was just such a phenomenal education. It was an eye-opener. It, it put things in perspective, not just in life, but for here in Canada. I, mean, just, I was blown away by, by what I discovered out on the road, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'll be doing it until my body says uh, no more. You stayed in hostels wherever you went? Pretty much. Uh, I was the budget traveler, so hotels and those types of things were, were out of it. Uh, and I found hostels fantastic because they, um, the people you came across were, were other travelers, other young people with open minds, and you got to know them. So you could be in South Africa, for example, but you'd be meeting people from Australia, from Germany, from England, from all over the world. And in my experiences in hotels, 
you don't talk to anybody. You don't even know who's staying in the room next to you. So traveling in the hostels, yes, you save a lot of money, but, man, you meet some fantastic people and have some truly yeah, I, phenomenal experiences. I totally agree. I mean, I had such a great experience when I was traveling in hostels. And another thing is when you're alone, you meet so many more people than if you're traveling in, like, a couple or a group or something. So that was one of the things that I really loved as well, the the bits that I did when I, when I was alone. And Europe. I mean, there's some great hostels there. I, I don't know about any of the other places you went, but there's some really great, clean... Uh, Oh, fantastic sure. hostels around around Europe. And so. in my opinion, I think ho- European hostels are the worst of the bunch. Once you get into really? Southern Africa, there's a whole. I found European hostels. They were clean. They were friendly. But if you had questions, the tourist office is down the road. In Southern Africa, uh, when I got there in '99, tourism was quite new. So the backpacking community up and down the coast really looked out for for one another and in a lot of cases you were staying in somebody's home and sitting at their dinner table for dinner with these other travelers it just an extra element of hospitality that i found there and in southeast asia and australia that I didn't quite find in europe but, but there was there was one great. hostel i know the book the pictures in the book uh, you, you want to go to matt's website matt com to see the pictures in color because there's one hostel you stayed at in south africa i mean it's like a beach resort it was it's probably one of the most beautiful places i've ever seen no electricity no telephones. You're set in a natural amphitheater out overlooking the ocean. Uh, pods of dolphin would swim by in the morning. That's how I'd start my day watching the sunrise over the over the ocean. Secluded beach to your to your left. Absolutely nobody there. There'd be more cattle on the beach mm-hmm. than than people. And uh, it was a part of the world where uh, it was extremely poor, but there was a a dignity in the poverty and a sense of hospitality that I think we've lost here in North America. So not only was the, the setting absolutely spectacular, but the the education, the people I met, just uh, really opened my eyes and put things in, in perspective. Did you use any books as your guide? Because for me, I mean, those the, the Lonely Planet books and stuff like that, they give you some really good advice on where to stay. So did you have something like that, or were you just totally winging it and like, I'm going to show up? I Where was totally I winging it. Okay. Um, some bu- guidebooks are good. I found that you know, Lonely Planet's great for the maps. A lot of times those are, you know, by the time the, they're, they've gone to publication, the hostel may be gone. It may be right. a different owner. Maybe Word of mouth is the best way to go. Uh, you mentioned something traveling alone, you're kind of forced into to talking with other people. Well, you know what? Ask them where they stayed. Yeah. And you get a good vibe from them whether or not a spot is something that you, you may like. Guidebooks are just that, guidebooks. Really yep. look at somebody in the eye and talk to them. And, and that's how I came across this place called The Crawl in South Africa. It was it was word of mouth. It was hardly in any guidebooks uh, at all. So. All right. So you started in, uh, you started in Glasgow. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, Amsterdam uh, can't be far behind. No, no, not mm-hmm. far at all. Amsterdam was about, uh, I guess, a month into the trip. Uh, beautiful city, very friendly, very open-minded, liberal people, and yeah, I, I got stuck there for for a few weeks. Um, <laughs> if, if you want, I had a nice little routine, uh, but thankfully the the weather turned on me, and uh, I decided to get somewhere warm. That was another condition of my travels. <laughs> I was fed up with the winter and never wanted to see it again, so I was going to travel with the sun. So even though you were in a you were in a blissful state of mind, it mm-hmm. is what you hear about, right? In in Amsterdam, what most people hear who've never been you've been i have yes yeah it, sh- it is it, that is just you know what that is the the red light district is just one section and one segment of of amsterdam in fact if you talk to most people most of the dutch they never smoked uh it's a very touristy thing for me that was one side of it i just find the city itself absolutely beautiful uh and the people really really friendly very open-minded uh just uh, a good spot to go and uh, kick your heels up and mellow out if you want and it's so clean i mean everybody bikes there like people do not drive cars around amsterdam they're very very environmentally conscious that was one of the things that i really loved was just seeing everybody out on their bikes all the time i mean it's just that's what they use for their mode of transport exactly i've been back a few times since (laughs)